real glad to be here. My first uh, trip to uh, Cape Cod Symposium was last year, and then they, they asked me to come back and speak, which I'm really grateful for. I have to make a confession. I'm here for the lobster and fried clams. My <laughs> father's from Maine, my mother's from Boston, and I do remember that since I was a youngin. May I ask, uh, just real quickly, so I can kind of get a, a feel for the audience, how many people here have prescriptive authority? M MDDO? Okay. It's so about half. Okay. Um, and I don't know how many of you are affiliated with, with programs like mine, but again, we are part of a, a general medical center, general medical surgical uh, center. And any of y'all ever feel like you're kind of the redheaded stepchildren? Yeah. That's, that's the way we are. Um, which has pro advantages and disadvantages. We know that 99% of the people over at the main hospital have not a clue what we do for a living. But the, the, the uh, other side of the coin of that is they leave us alone, okay? <laughs> so that, that's really helpful because um, the, everybody in this field, uh, you, you get, we get paid for it. I get salaried uh, for it as well, but I think all of us in here know the, that we treat a, treat a unique group of folks, and you need the expertise that we share with each other to be able to treat all the all the uh, unique things about this uh, group of individuals that we treat. Um, this is my slide that they sent me to put in say, saying I'm a working stiff and I'm not smart enough to speak for the drug companies and make extra money. <laughs> so what I want to talk about today, and hopefully this is some new information, uh, I was taught early in medical school a little truism, and that is if you don't think of the diagnosis, you're not going to make the diagnosis. If somebody coughs and all you think of is pneumonia, then you're going to forget to, to look for tuberculosis. And, and if somebody's got a temperature elevation and the only thing that you know with the temperature elevation is pneumonia, then you're going to forget there's a hundred other things that can cause temperature elevation. The same is true for therapeutic modalities. That if we don't think about some other therapeutic modality that we can bring into play to help relieve the uh, suffering uh, of, of our patients, then we're not going to think of either prescribing it, performing it, obtaining it, or referring our patient for it. And, and that's a lot of what I want to do today is just kind of remind you and increase our level of awareness that there are multiple modalities out there that can be useful to treat specific symptoms such as pain, anxiety, uh, and sleep disturbance in, in our patients uh, other than uh, opiates, opiates, and opiates. Okay, although opiates do have their, their, their place. Uh, again, I think we just saw a talk by somebody who used the same uh, quote, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual threatened tissue damage or described in terms of such. Now, what does that mean? I have this crushing pain. I have this burning, shooting pain. And when we hear those words, most of us in the helping professions are going to say, you know, that's not saying I have a little mild ache. So uh, patients that, that describe that they are in pain, although it's no longer this fifth vital sign, I agree completely with uh, the speaker that we just, just left that it never was a sign because we have to believe our patients. But a lot of our patients are generally describing an extremely unpleasant sensation, and I bet that there's more than a few people in here who have had acute and chronic pain disorders that basically you would have done pretty well anything to get some relief from because it's one of the most unpleasant experiences the human body can, can go through. Now acute pain again is usually self-limited. I break an arm, I twist an ankle, um, I have a, a short-term headache, it comes and it goes uh, after the healing process occurs. And this is something that's usually not too difficult to treat with. Most physicians and prescribers are going to agree most of the time on the best way to treat acute uh, self-limited pain. Again, usually a few days to up to a month. But what I want to emphasize today is that there are multiple areas from the site of injury up to the cortex that we can intervene with to provide therapeutic modalities that can alleviate some of these pain signals that are firing up the nerve through the brachial plexus if it's the upper extremity, goes into the dorsal column of the spine. And then these electrical signals fire up the spinal cord, and then once they reach areas of the brain, after passing through multiple areas of nerve cells, synapses that don't touch each other, but send chemical signals from one nerve cell to the next, each of these different areas gives us a level where we can intervene and hopefully be able to alleviate our patient's suffering, not just uh, maybe sometimes including opiates, but not all the time. 
So after it gets up to the brain, that's when we say, aha, this is a pain signal, and I am suffering with this pain signal. And, and again, most of us have experienced either personally or, or close relations or patients who have suffered with acute and chronic pain disorders. Chronic pain, again, is a more of an issue that we have to deal with. And we've had speakers this morning and this afternoon that are going to address this because it's such a critical issue in our society today. But this is pain that continues beyond apparent healing. Generally, three months, six months, people draw the line, but most, most authors use three months or, or longer of chronic pain disorder. And then we have, of course, chronic pain syndrome, which is the exquisite suffering, the family dysfunction. Oh, chronic pain is a family disease. Do we know any other disease that actually affects the family like that? I guess we, we probably do. But we adopt the sick role and we're, we don't work, we can't get off the couch, our, our family you know, drops everything that they're doing to attend to our pain. This is a terrible syndrome. That, uh, that occurs not in every patient with chronic pain, but in many um, patients with chronic pain. Again, chronic pain syndrome, more than six months of pain, altered behavior, depression, mood symptoms virtually 100% of the time, restricted daily activities, no clear association with the organic disorder, and lots of surgeries and lots of tests and lots of your tax dollars and mine that go to Medicare and Medicaid and, and other insurance to pay for procedures that don't bring about a whole heck of a lot of improvement. Then we have this horrible term substance abuse, which thank goodness I am not hearing nearly as much as I used to, even in meetings with professionals. Every time I hear that, I, I kind of cringe, and I'm glad this is being gradually eliminated uh, because it sounds too much like child abuse or spousal abuse. And we go to the definition of addiction that most of us are comfortable with, the this American Society of Addiction Medicine definition of addiction, that it's a brain disease uh, related to abnormalities in motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Uh, loss of control, continued use despite uh, uh, adverse consequences, craving, and so forth, with cycles of relapse and remission, okay? And again, we had a speaker last night that, that again, most of society still believes that we've got the fix. Somebody comes into our black box from the left, and they go out on the right, and they're cured, and if they relapse, that means treatment didn't work. So this is, uh, nobody says that about asthma and diabetes for some reason. <laughs> Okay, pseudo-addiction may be a common term to you, or maybe the first time that you've heard it, but in people who treat a lot of pain disorders, pseudo-addiction comes up frequently. Any nurses in here? Okay, yeah, thank you. Especially if you're working um, on a med surge unit, but it could be in, in multiple different uh, scenarios, you get the button pushed, okay, at four, three hours and 59 minutes after the last opioid, okay? And what do you say at the nurse's station? Oh, God, here she comes again. I mean, not, not people at a meeting like this, but a lot of nurses do. And I'm not being critical of nurses. You know, uh, my mother was a nurse. But at the same time, it's hard to not blame somebody for constantly being uh, needy and wanting more pain medication. But not all these patients are out for the euphoric effect by any stretch of the imagination that a lot of times they appear drug seeking, but retrospectively we can see it was pseudo addiction after the pain has been effectively treated. The example I give to a lot of nurses, with one of the good things our health system does is 100% of any nurse or, or, or uh, point of, of uh, care technician that comes into the health center has to listen to a lecture from myself or my associate on the disease of addiction. And we talk to them about this stuff right now. So we, we try to educate them that some of these patients are actually in need of more analgesia. And I, I ask a nurse usually, you know, what, what is a typical nurse uh, order that a doctor will give for Dilaudid after surgery? And the answer is usually one to two milligrams IV every four hours is needed for pain. And I say, well, how long does Dilaudid last? Well, that's for about two hours. So what are you supposed to do for the next two hours? You sit and suffer. So sometimes doctors make mistakes and we forget half-lives of medications, but when we adjust the dose and frequency adequately, people are very comfortable. And if you had your uh, back operated on or your abdomen opened up, you'd want adequate analgesia too and would probably be complaining and wouldn't want to be a label that addict down in room 402. So let's keep in mind that sometimes inadequate analgesia falsely labels somebody as being drug seeking. Physical dependence, again, most of us in this room, we, we know the difference between addiction and physical dependence, but there was so many people 
for so many years, like I came into the field when I started my addiction fellowship in 1990, and only then were we starting to begin to understand the difference between physical dependence and addiction. I still have sweet little old ladies who've been on uh, you know, two and a half milligrams of Valium for the last 20 years from their primary care physician to sleep, and they want to come in because they don't want to become a drug addict. So I, I usually sit down and talk with them and saying, man, if you've been on the same dose and it's not causing any problems, et cetera, et cetera, you just go back to Dr. Jones, you're not a drug addict, don't worry, it's not gonna turn you into an addict, you might be physically dependent, but you're not a drug addict. So helping to know these definitions can help our patients and their families understand what's going on. Tolerance, of course, uh, just about everybody in this room understands, is the escalation of dose that addicts get so that when we are active in our disease, we are taking on a regular basis an amount that would be lethal to the average uh, cow or horse, much less human being, and that is unique to the disease of addiction, that most people have a slight escalation in dose, but then there are these people like my wife who can't even finish one glass of wine, which I think is really strange, and her tolerance has been the same ever since I've known her, and never escalates beyond uh, one glass of wine or so. Okay, so why, does this, why is this important to us? Because people with addiction have differences. We understand from earlier speakers and, and from our, our background knowledge that our brain changes, our brain sends new connections out and alters when we begin the process of addiction. And when do the great majority of our patients begin using chemicals? When they're adolescents. We have a plastic, malleable brain. I'm so old that when I was in medical school, they taught us that when we were born, the brain was hard and fixed. We know that's ridiculous now. It is still malleable well into our early 20s. So we form new connections <clears throat> that become abnormal, if you will, abnormal meaning away from the norm, once we start using chemicals, and some of those changes are permanent. So here's one of my favorite sentences. It took me a long time to come up with this. Concurrent neurophysiologic changes related to active chemical dependency or pre-existing biogenetically mediated neurophysiologic idiosyncrasies associated with the disease of addiction may shape the experience of pain. Isn't that a great sentence? What does it mean? It means, it, it means we feel, addicts feel pain differently than other folks because our brain has been so insulted by booze and drugs for so long and or pre-existing genetically mediated differences in our dopamine response to mood altering chemicals and to pain signals that we may experience pain signals differently and more intense thus leading us to start using more analgesic medications like opiates and then the addiction kicks in we, we desire that dopamine uh, response and on we go some of these changes are permanent and uh, again use an example I just had about three days ago I got a call from one of the hospitals where we practice <clears throat> where I practice I, I do consultations there and he very appropriately called and said you know I've got one somebody who's been treated over there at Shepherd Hill before he's doing well but he's not responding to normal doses of Dilaudid after he had surgery I said he need to double or triple the dose because his tolerance is going to be permanently elevated and I'll come see him and we'll talk about recovery, make sure his sponsor's coming in and so forth. But some of these changes are permanent. So, so this, this line means addicts feel pain differently in many circumstances. Also, we have associated anxiety and depression. Do any of our patients ever have mood disturbances along with their addiction? You know, how about the great majority of them? So we have to take that into consideration. That's fr very frequent with people in, in chronic pain and acute pain and untreated pain also is a relapse risk in and of itself. Let's not forget that giving someone opiates over the short term for a broken ankle is going to put them at increased risk for a relapse to their addiction. But under treating it is going to do the same thing. So we have to do this delicate dance of picking, of picking appropriate therapeutic modalities to alleviate acute pain and chronic pain that will lower the risk as low as we can get it for our patients to reactivate their disease of addiction. Opiates, again, are potentially helpful, but we all know that they have a downside. They hit you know, our mu receptors and they fire off our dopamine receptors, and oh boy, I remember that feeling. Okay, and I could have been sober for five, 10, 15 years and still be at increased uh, risk for relapse to, to my addiction. So, and sometimes it just basically is, is difficult to treat because we, their tolerance is so high chronically. It does go down some, of course, with time and abstinence, 
but permanently their, their tolerance is going to be abnormally high, therefore we have to give more opiates, therefore we risk their euphoric effect, therefore we re risk uh, rea reactivating their disease of addiction. So sometimes it's difficult for patients themselves and docs to tell the difference. Okay, as, as we all know, there's more than one opiate receptor, or as, as you know now, there's more than one opiate receptor. We talk about the opiate receptor, but of course there are multiple different opioid receptors. The one we primarily talk about is the mu receptor because that is what produces not only pain relief, but euphoria. And obviously, you know, we don't use opiates as, when we're active in our disease because we want to get pain relief. We want to get that euphoric effect from the release of uh, dopamine. Then we have delta receptors and we have kappa receptors. And some of these strange people out there actually swallow their first Percocet and don't like the way it makes them feel. There's a little more affinity for the kappa receptor when they actually get dysphoric or nauseated. Those are strange people, but they, they do exist out there. Otherwise, we'd be treating the entire country. This is a nice picture to me. Again, I, I'm kind of a visual person. I like to carry around pictures in my head. And I also have these pictures that I stole from a, a drug company pamphlet. And I like to show patients this is kind of what it looks like. And when I give lectures to the patients who are in residential treatment, this is kind of what a mu opioid receptor kind of maybe looks like. And it's got a little hand up there that just wants to get a perfect chemical to fit in like a glove. And that's one of these little grape-like things. It's a molecule of morphine or some other opioid. And when that happens, this electrical discharge feels like what, folks? Feels like an orgasm, doesn't it? I mean, it gets you high. If you have the disease of addiction, even if you don't, it makes you feel pretty good. But those of us with the disease of addiction, this feels incre like incredible euphoria. But this is a normal occurring structure. Every human being has these in their brain, but somehow people with the disease of addiction, both because of uh, genetic influence and because of age of onset of use of opiates, have a more intense reaction and then eventually our prefrontal cortex goes to sleep for a few years and we start seeking and, and obtaining and using opiates no matter what, uh, what it takes. <clears throat> this is more of a cartoon representation, again, to make sure you have kind of a picture in your mind understanding what we're talking about here, a full opioid receptor, whether we're talking about diacetyl morphine, whether we're talking about morphine, whether we're talking about oxycodone, fits absolutely perfectly into the mu receptor site, and we call that a full agonist. Then we have another group of, of drugs, uh, Stadol is one, Nubane is another, but the one that's come into uh, the forefront in our field, of course, is buprenorphine, brand name uh, Suboxone, uh, along with a few other brand names. I don't want to offend any of our people down there in the, uh, Bunavale and, and the other uh, uh, sites, but most people come in looking for their subs. And this kind of partially fits in there. <clears throat> what does that mean? It means it's not a full agonist. It means it doesn't produce the euphoria <clears throat> that full opioid agonist. And every speaker that gets up here, whether they say it or not, have their own opinions, and I'm certainly opinionated. Uh, have any of y'all been to the Ohio State University Addiction Studies Institute? Is that, okay, it's too far to the west over in flyover country. Well, it's real similar to this. We get about a thousand people a year there. And the last time I spoke, it was on pharmacotherapy. And I was talking about buprenorphine and how appropriately prescribed, and I had, someone just get up and storm out because she was so anti-buprenorphine. And I know how deeply held some of these feelings are that if someone's on methadone or somebody's on buprenorphine or somebody's on even naltrexone, then that's not abstinence-based treatment and we can have our differences there. But, but I do use buprenorphine, prescribe it appropriately and follow patients on my outpatient clinic for buprenorphine uh, maintenance after detoxification. So buprenorphine fits in partially. It doesn't produce euphoria, but it holds onto that receptor really tightly, which keeps other opiates from being able to fit into that receptor that we just saw a picture of and can be very useful, as we'll talk a little bit later, for pain relief in addition to maintenance therapy for opiate use disorders. Then we have a uh, third drug available to us, which is naloxone or naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist that essentially covers over the opiate receptor and doesn't let any opiates in. So what we need to do, and, and this is to a lot of physicians here, and, and if you have the wisdom and the desire for knowledge uh, to come to a conference like this, you already know most of this. But for doctors especially who take care of patients in the hospital with acute painful disorders, but also chronic pain disorders, our patients need reassurance from their caregivers. I know you're a recovering addict. I understand what that means. I'm not gonna not treat you because you're a recovering addict. 
because we sit here and emphasize to our patients how important it is to let their caregivers know that they have the disease of addiction, right? Okay? You don't not tell your doctor that you're allergic to penicillin or that you're diabetic. You've got to tell them. So how do a lot of members of the medical profession react to that? Oh. So what we have to do is, is convince our brethren, our medical brethren and, and nurses and other people in medical care teams that these are human beings too that have a chronic disease just like diabetes and deserve care. But if I'm in charge of your surgery, then I'm going to tell you I'm going to take care of your pain even though I know you're an addict and hopefully I understand what I'm talking about. Under treatment of acute pain can create cravings. And if you won't give it to me, then I'm going to have my brother bring it in. I've got an IV access right here, and that's, that's obviously happened in many hospital situations. So if patients come in the hospital for another medical condition, you don't that, that includes, of course, pain. We do not detoxify them from opiates at that time. That's something to be taken care of later. If they're alcohol dependent, benzodiazepine dependent, obviously we have to detoxify appropriately in that situation, but not opioids. Now, when I talked originally about if you don't think of the therapeutic modality, we're not going to use the therapeutic modality. There's one therapeutic modality that I see over and over and over and over and over underutilized even in the hospital, and that is ice. Ice is a wonderful analgesic medication. The worst painful condition I ever had in my life was a broken rib. Oh my God, if you ever had it, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's agonizing. And an ice pack was an absolutely wonderful therapeutic modality. <clears throat> when I had my office in, in Arkansas before I moved to Ohio, I treated a lot of patients with chronic headache disorders. A lot of these were tension type headaches. A lot of these were post-concussive headaches. And I started using TENS units uh, right and left, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulators, okay? This is probably familiar to most of you, but incredibly underutilized. A lot of them are available. You don't have to have a, a DEA waiver to prescribe a TENS unit. And the most expensive part about this after you purchase it, which are now 40 or 50 bucks, is replacing the 9 volt battery in there. And you put on the electrodes, you self administer them, and they can be remarkably effective for both acute and chronic pain disorders. But if we don't think of a TENS unit, then we're not going to prescribe it. It's an awful lot cheaper than, than um, a month's worth of, of opiates in many cases. Regional anesthesia, my, my partner that's in practice with me now, uh, since he finished his fellowship, is an uh, anesthesiologist who's in recovery. And anesthesiologists, you know, do regional anesthesia all the time. They, they use brachial nerve blocks and, and they use uh, spinal blockades. These can be extremely effective for patients in early, in early recovery. And matter of fact, sometimes in, in acute painful conditions, and for those in early recovery, pose zero relapse risk. So keep these modalities in mind. TENS units, ICE, and um, uh, regional anesthesia for people who, need, who have painful conditions who need something other than opiates. Yes, sir? What's the mechanism of action of TENS? Does it stimulate the nerves, I think? What is the mechanism of, if I knew that, I'd, I'd write a textbook on it. Ask Norman Sheely in Springfield, Missouri. He's the guy that invented it about 35 years ago. And even he said he's not sure. The most authors think that it essentially confuses the pain signals going up through the dorsal column and adds extra electrical stimulation such that the brain does not focus solely on the electrical uh, uh, signals coming up the dorsal column that are interpreted as pain. But again, it's completely benign. Yes, sir? They also talk about the gate theory. The gate theory is also another theory yes. that I've read about. That kind of went out of favor and now it's back in favor. Yes, the nurse can, can only transmit a given number of electrical signals to overwhelm it with, with minor, slightly irritating signals that can't the other signals that you don't want. Exactly. And it's, it's the, again, Norman Sheely is the guy that gets credit for it. He's a neurosurgeon that stopped doing neurosurgery and started doing chronic pain management <clears throat> in, um, he's in uh, Springfield, Missouri, is the last place I knew he was. It's like, what a brilliant idea. I mean, would this come to in the middle of the night or what? But we don't use it. I have not seen a TENS unit being used and I can't remember when. But nobody gets addicted to TENS signals any more than they do to ICE. I, I have never treated anybody with, with uh, TENS use disorder. Okay. <laughs> For those um, who do need opiates, and, and again, I give I this talk to the hospitalists and the people in the, in the hospital where I practice, and most of them you know, don't even bother to come to the talk because they already know it all. But what I really like to emphasize is if an individual in recovery is going to need intravenous opioid analgesia for a period of time, such as after a major fracture or major surgery, 
then rather than getting boluses all the time, a, a patient-controlled administration pump can be very, very helpful. It gives them control over their analgesia, but still they don't know exactly how many milligrams they're getting and how often, and you lock it out after 15 minutes or 30 minutes and so much per hour and so much per four hours, and they actually have a sense of analgesia because they can press that button. This is really important in most hospitals, I won't t use that word, a lot of hospitalists who now are in charge of hospital care now, and those of you who practice in hospitals you know, know this is obvious, but some of you might not practice much in hospitals, is that your family doc doesn't take care of you in the hospital anymore. It's a whole new specialty of hospitalists. <coughs> And some of them are very well trained, but a lot of them are internists and don't have a whole lot of experience in post-surgical pain. So we have to kind of bring them up to speed to make sure that they know these people are in pain and they need analgesia and not everybody needs, you know, two milligrams of Dilaudid every four hours is needed for pain. Some of them, this, this uh, PCA pump can be very, very helpful. Okay, <clears throat> additional PRN doses uh, can be used, but th this is a good way to help patients realize you're not going to sit there and suffer. You are in control. Just that sensation of not being helpless and having to call the nurse's station and wonder what they're going to think every four hours is, is really helpful. There's a couple of new modalities that are surprisingly effective. It's intravenous acetaminophen and intravenous ibuprofen has come out relatively recently. And these can be surprisingly effective. You wouldn't think, oh, I don't, what is this? Well, that's a couple of Tylenol. That's not going to do anything. Well, what's this medication? Oh, this is a real powerful pain-relieving medication that you're getting intravenously, and it's the same dose of, of acetaminophen, and it can be very, very effective. And we use this in our hospital post-surgically quite frequently with very good results. Now, the downside is it's expensive as hell. Two Tylenol costs two cents, and an intravenous dose costs, I don't know, 50 or $100. But in order to get somebody out of the hospital, give them adequate analgesia with no chance of addiction or euphoria or mood alteration, these are very effective co-occurring medications that can be used for acute pain, especially in post-surgical pain. And also we need to emphasize to our patients and the doctors and the family, bring the meeting to the patient. Keep in touch with your sponsor. Okay, have a couple of people come up and read the big book and, and talk about recovery to reinforce the fact <clears throat> that I'm in recovery and I want to stay there. These are obvious to those of us in the field, but to those of us not in the field who work in hospitals that we're in, in touch with, we have to remind them, well, what is this thing about calling a sponsor? What's so important about that? What's this big book business? If we can talk to the patient and talk to their caregivers, we can really help our patients remind themselves on a daily basis that they don't want to get back to where they were before when they needed our help so badly. Okay, having an active sponsor, maintaining stability in the workplace, stability at home, because patients eventually are going to go home. If they're in the hospital after surgery, it used to be you were in the hospital for what, three weeks? Now it's what, three hours? And then you're home. So we have to make sure the patients are educated as to how to take care of themselves, educate the family members, make sure that they're in contact with their sponsor. If they do start back to work again on, on an um, immediate basis, these stabilizing factors can help keep them in recovery. We always have to be, uh, physicians especially, we have to make sure that the patients, when they start complaining of pain, doc, I'm just not getting better, that we haven't missed something, we didn't leave an instrument in there, there's not an abscess forming, the surgery was not effective. We don't always go to the fact that this is just an addict looking for, anal for opiates, okay? Sometimes we might be the ones that made the mistake and we have to keep that humility going. Okay, <clears throat> sometimes our patients are requesting and desiring opiates for acute pain because they are scared, okay? <clears throat> Docs and nurses especially, you know, we know what surgery is and we know what a hemostat is and we know what healing time is and we know how long it takes bone to heal. Non-physicians, non-nurses don't know that stuff, and being in the hospital is a real scary deal, okay, for any human being. And therefore, if I get a medication like an opiate that not only relieves pain, but also relieves a lot of my anxiety and fear, then I'm going to desire more of it. So reassuring uh, patients that they're going to get well, that they're on schedule can be really, really helpful to help keep the total dose of opiates minimized. Um, I'm going to talk just briefly about methadone. Again, our, our speaker uh, over lunch talked about methadone. I think this is an excellent medication for a very narrow uh, few individuals who need it for chronic pain disorders uh, to get back on their feet again. I'm not a real fan of Oxycontin, obviously, but methadone I think can be very helpful. 
Uh, any doctor with a Schedule II DEA ticket can prescribe methadone for pain. This is one of the weird things about the DEA is that I can, you, you can prescribe 120 milligrams a day for chronic pain, but you can't do it for addiction over here unless you have a special waiver and you have to give it every day. That's what happens when politicians and lawyers get involved in health care. Uh, this is the goal that we are, the therapeutic range for methadone for pain relief, adequate analgesia, without getting into sedation and vomiting and respiratory arrest, and without slipping down here for, I need more pain, this is not enough for me. So again, we have methadone, which is a weird drug, useful for uh, heroin and other opioid use disorders, but also good for chronic pain and also can be useful for both, for patients who have chronic pain disorders that aren't going to get any better and for individuals with the disease of opiate use disorder. So keeping this in our therapeutic armamentarium at the forefront of, of thinking is very helpful. I've had many talks with doctors, I get family docs calling in, in hospitals saying, well, what about this and what about that? And I, I got patients taking you know, two or three Percocet every two hours and, and they're all of a sudden on, on 30 Percocet a day and the, and the family doc calls and say, what do I do? I said, try some, you know, a long acting medication like methadone because right now he's cycling up and down. He said, well, I can't prescribe methadone. You know, I don't have a DEA waiver for it. So again, bring this level of awareness back to your community and keep it in mind for patients who might be that narrow number of people who can really benefit from chronic opioid use like methadone when in proper hands it can be very, very helpful. Buprenorphine, again, <clears throat> a speaker this morning, I, I was in this room for a talk. He has the same experience I do. Uh, first of all, I have a letter from the DEA from 2002 that, that Howard Height, who, who gives talks all the time on chronic pain and addiction, uh, provided for us, that says that prescribing buprenorphine off-label for pain is perfectly legal for any doctor with a Schedule Three DEA waiver. It's just like prescribing Tylenol codeine or, or, um, uh, or another analgesic in the Schedule Three. But most doctors are terrified of doing it because they think they have to have a waiver to prescribe it for anything. Well, heck, I was using buprenorphine back in, when I was an emergency physician back in the 80s when somebody come in for a kidney stone or, uh, and, and we'd give them 0.3 milligrams of buprenorphine intramuscularly. It's been around for a long time. So it can be used and it can be very effective anal for an analgesic. Uh, perfect example was my new partner's wife just had major back fusion surgery and she's been in recovery uh, for two years leading up to that and she was scared to death not of the surgery but that her disease would be reactivated so here she had her husband and me you know two addiction guys hovering over her and said we'll take care of this as best we can and she had her surgery she did very well she was on uh, oxycodone uh, immediate release for about five days after the surgery, and she said, I'm getting a little bit better, so we put her on buprenorphine. She said, I don't want that oxycodone, that's crap. Buprenorphine relieves my pain a lot better than the oxycodone did. It is a very effective analgesia. It has a reputation for being a wimp, but actually can be a very effective analgesic medication without the euphoric effects, without the overdose, without the respiratory depression, and again, we need to take this knowledge and information back to our communities because most doctors don't want anything to do with it. Yes, sir. You just have to be careful. <clears throat> the problem with using it off table for people who aren't trained is the issue of precipitated withdrawal. Well, again, uh, hopefully any doctor that writes that prescription is going to know, you know, indications, contraindications, adverse effects, and what they're doing. I'm not saying, oh, oh just start doing it willy-nilly. You're right. They have to do their homework on it. They have to read about it and they have to be knowledgeable about it. And somebody coming off of a high dose of, of methadone, let's say, or, or, or oxycodone, we can precipitate it because the buprenorphine molecule wants to displace those other opioids off the mu receptor. And we can precipitate withdrawal. But just the knowledge that we have something available, what really brought this to mind is when uh, propoxyphene or Darvocet was taken off the market, which it should have been a long time ago. But we had this opiate that family docs felt very comfortable with prescribing over the long term for mild to moderate pain. And when that disappeared, I started suggesting, why don't you try some buprenorphine? It's really good stuff. It's really good for mild to moderate pain in very low doses. 
is not going to, you know, you're not going to have people going out and, and um, selling it on the street for a whole bunch of money. Yes, it does have street value. I'm not going to disagree with that. Nobody yet in my community has used it. We've got about 200 docs in our, in our um, county that work with the hospital. Nobody else has used it yet. Yes, ma'am. Unfortunately, at least in our area, the major pharmaceutical chains will not fill the Buprenorphine prescription without an XDEA. Even if the discussion occurs that this is not for um, opioid treatment, this is for pain, we are not taking the risk of filling a buprenorphine prescription without an XPEA. And then they also say, and the insurance won't take it either. Well, I know that, well, okay, in your area, maybe that's true. Where, where is that? Western Mass. Oh, okay. People's Republic of Massachusetts. Okay. <laughs> I, you, you're, the, you're the first time you're the first time that I've, I've heard that. Uh, maybe that's becoming in the Northeast. And you, I, I know things are a bit different, South, Midwest, and, and West, and so forth. But that's the first time I've heard that. If you want to email me, <coughs> excuse me, I got a card up here. I will send you a letter from the DEA, 2002, saying it's perfectly legal to do that, and you can pass that out to. I've done that before. I've, I've given it to docs. I've given it to pharmacists, and so forth. So, th so they will feel assured that it's number one legal, and number two, it, it's a perfectly it's a FDA approved drug. So, we need to hammer that door down. You spend. Um, I did Butrans patch without any trouble and put diagnosis on the screen. But Butrans patch is not a pain. But Butrans is for pain. It, that's what it came out yeah, for yeah, was for pain. But I mean, on the prescription, writing it that way. Yeah, and that, that's the way it should be. It's a perfectly legal medication. Yes, sir. Yeah, her statement about insurance not paying for it if it's used for pain treatment, um, I find that as well. Any suggestions on attacking that? Uh, it's the first time I've ever heard that. Uh, where, where, are you, where do you practice, sir? I'm sorry, maybe it's unique to the Northeast. I, I, I've never heard that before. It, it, it's never come up in the Midwest before that I'm aware of, so I don't have re really anything to address other than I'll, I'll freely email this letter from the DEA to anybody who wants it to see if that's helpful. You know, it comes up when you're going for a prior authorization and most of the script management companies will ask that question, is this being used solely for the treatment of pain? And then it's just an instant denial and they don't hear anything. Well, to me it's pretty obvious that's financially driven, not clinically driven. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, uh, sometimes we've found that pharmacies the large corporate pharmacies are setting their own policy and that even though there's a law and you can show them the law, they say, well, we're not adhering to this, this is our policy. So sometimes you find a non-CBS or Dwayne Reed situation that in trouble. They're, they're much more amenable to looking at law as opposed to their corporate policy. Thank you for educating. I, I have never heard of that being a, a problem in, in my area, so maybe it's coming from the east to the Midwest, but I, I've never heard of that before. I, I hope it goes away. Is the methadone more accepted to be used for pain than suboxone by insurance companies? Unless they ever. Which, which, which is remarkable that methadone has been used for chronic pain disorders since the 1940s when the Germans came up with it, and it's been. I've never heard of methadone being rejected because, it's, number one, it's dirt cheap. And number two, it is more potent and more efficacious, but most patients, most doctors will start patients on very low doses, sometimes 10 or 20 milligrams twice a day, and then you better not move it up any more than any three days because obviously it has an extended half-life and it takes time to, to, um, for, to, for it to equilibrate in the human body. I don't prescribe methadone because I don't I, I treat chronic pain in my current position, but there's a lot of family docs who are forced into it, if you will, in my community because we only have one pain management clinic that'll get them started on methadone and then they'll turn it over to the family docs. But again, in my area, I've never heard of methadone not being paid for uh, by insurance companies. And one of the main reasons is because it's so cheap, so inexpensive. Um, and, and again, I apologize here. Okay, Th this is just a little uh, short video to kind of demonstrate uh, Obviously, and again, I know there's a lot of differing feelings in here, pro and con, about buprenorphine for uh, opiate use disorder. But we do know that a partial agonist like buprenorphine holds very tightly to the mute opioid receptor. Most morphine molecules or full agonists will not uh, be able to overcome the blockade, except for very high doses of, of fentanyl in many cases. 
but also that the electrical discharge that I liken to an orgasm initially is much, 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 much weaker with buprenorphine. Yes, you have individuals that will take the mono product, Subutex is not available as that brand anymore, it's, they're all generics, and crush them up and inject them and they will produce euphoria. But I don't know any good self-respecting drug addict that's gonna shoot Subutex when they can get heroin. I mean, they're gonna use it if nothing else is available, which is why I agree with the speaker a little bit earlier that I prescribe uh, mono products, so buprenorphine only for pregnant women and, and, and also for lactating women. And I know there's some disagreement. We can probably go ahead and prescribe it to lactating women, but uh, I'm nervous enough prescribing anything to pregnant lactating women, but I still use the mono product only. And I also agree with him. I've never in my life actually seen or really heard of a person who actually has an allergic reaction to naloxone. And I've even had a conversation with our allergist and she's researched her literature and can't find it. So if somebody comes in saying, I want, I want Subutex, I had a bad reaction to Suboxone, my reaction is, let me tell you about this drug called Vivitrol, okay? It, it, it works just fine for somebody with a naloxone allergy. Yes, sir. Do you classify headache as an allergic reaction in a, no. with naloxone? Not a hypersensitivity reaction. It might be an adverse reaction, but not, not a, an allergic reaction. Yeah, well, some people do have side effects. There's no question whatsoever, okay? But not a true allergic reaction. I broke out in a rash, my throat, you know, collapsed and so forth, and I almost died. Those I don't believe. But if somebody has an adverse side effect, there's, I'm not saying it's wrong to prescribe monoproduct to non-pregnant women. I'm just saying you have to be very careful because that gives... <clears throat> I have tremendous respect for our brethren in the... In the uh, uh, probation office and, and police officers. However, the, the, kick, the kickback that I get from uh, law enforcement in my area is overwhelming. I get the finger pointed at me saying, Dr. Whitney wants everybody on Suboxone and they want everybody on Vivitrol. And the answer is, yeah, well, that's why there's 40 different drugs for high blood pressure and lots of different forms of insulin because you have to treat the patient, you know, it's not one drug fits all. So although there is going to be diversion of buprenorphine in, in every community, I'd much rather patients be buying Suboxone on the street than buying heroin, okay? In any case, non and inflammatory drugs, I, I wanna, again, get to these alternatives so we can have them on the forefront of our mind, consider therapeutic alternatives. These are extremely effective medications for treatment of acute and chronic pain. They're anti-inflammatory, they have a ceiling effect in terms of analgesic efficacy. So they're gonna be good for moderate pain, usually not for severe pain in and of themselves unless we combine them. 30 milligrams of Toradol, which is the first uh, parenteral analgesic non anti-inflammatory drug out on the market, has the same uh, pain relief effect of six to 10 milligrams of parenteral morphine. This is a really potent drug. I've used it, again, my, my other life when I was an emergency physician for kidney stones, and people actually preferred it to intravenous morphine or intravenous Dilaudid because they said it made them feel better. So this is not wimpy medication. This is a, a, a efficacious drug. Uh, COX-2 inhibitors like Celebrex, mo most doctors don't know. I, I learned this actually when I was uh, treating chronic headaches but there are eight different classes of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Most docs and a lot of people who write prescriptions and, and almost all lay people think all non-steroidal inflammatory drugs are the same. So if ibuprofen doesn't do the job, you know, nothing's gonna do the job. But that's not true. There's Sulindac, there's, there's, Clinor, there's Clinorel, there's, there's a number of different groups, subgroups of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and sometimes choosing one from several different groups until we find the one that's most efficacious can really help our patients with their chronic arthritic pain, with their uh, acute pain, with their tendonitis, whatever, by reducing pain and inflammation. But we have to really go back and review the literature to remind myself when I was in medical school taking pharma, uh, Pharmacology 101 that all non-steroidal inflammatories are not the same.